Rick was standing there, smiling at us. Well, go on. Grab your things and come in. You are all welcome here. I could tell by the looks on the others' faces that they were just as uneasy about this as me. His demeanour seemed to have changed pretty quickly from when we last saw him. I thought you said you were alone, I said, gesturing to the parked cars. His eyes met mine and his smile wavered a few times before he was able to keep it going. Never mind those. Most of them were here when I arrived, he said. I had been brushing the snow off every now and again. Gives me something to do when I need some fresh air. I looked over at Mrs. Barnes and she quickly nodded her head towards the boss. I think we're going to keep on going, I said. We just wanted to check in on you and make sure you were good here. We all backpedaled towards the boss. Rick's stare grew more intense. You don't have to leave. Stay. Stay here. There's plenty of room for all. His smile was now gone as we continued to walk back towards the boss. Don't go. Come on in. He took a few steps towards us. Don't be ungrateful. Stay here, he yelled. We'll give you some food and be on our way, Trish said, as we all moved faster. His voice returned to a normal volume. You're all going to die out there, but I... I can help you. I can... save you. I didn't like how he emphasised the word save when he said that, and no part of me thought it was a good idea to go inside. They're coming now, he said. Go tell him to shut off that bus if you want to live. Another noise could just barely be heard in addition to the rumble of the bus and the generator. Shut off the bus and come inside, he said, and then turned around and walked back into the garage area. The other noise was getting louder and would surely be here soon. I think we need to go in, I said. We'll have a hard time losing them or getting away in that bus. The others quickly agreed when we ran back to the bus. What's going on? Arvin asked. We need to get inside. Shut the bus off and hurry, Mrs. Barnes said. Ali made eye contact with me and looked frightened. I gave her a quick smile and made my way over to her. It's okay. We're just going to go inside for a little while until it's safe to go out again. Okay, Dad, she said, and then ran with Clara over to me. We got off the bus with the rest of our group and hustled over to the garage. As soon as we were all inside, the door began closing behind us. Dad, that's the thing that keeps the fumes out of the garage when the fire trucks are running in here, said Ali, pointing to the long flexible tube hanging from the ceiling. You remember that from Blippi, don't you? I said. Yep, she said with a smile. We used to watch his videos over and over when she was younger. I even dressed up as him for Halloween one year. Memories like these kept me going, in the hopes that things could return to normal one day. Or at least, close to normal. Aren't they going to find us in here? Adam said. What if there are a lot of them? There's no need to worry. I've got it all under control, said Rick. I see something, shouted Jessica. I grabbed Ollie's hand and looked out the glass window of the large garage door. One car came into view, followed by another, and then another. The first one stopped suddenly at the entrance to the fire station and turned into the parking lot. The other two cars soon followed and they all parked haphazardly by the boss. We all ducked down below the window so we couldn't be seen, although I doubted it would make much difference. Those of us with guns had them ready. Relax, there's no need to worry, Rick said. Everything is under control. We all ignored him and remained focused on the activity outside. The car doors opened and three people got out of the first car. Four people came out of both the second and third cars. They went over to the bus and walked around it, stopping for a couple of minutes out of view on the other side, by the door. Finally, they came back around the bus and headed towards the door. I crouched down below the window with the others before they could see me. We waited in silence for a while. Glancing over at Rick, I could see that he was not scared at all. With that creepy smile still on his face, I kept expecting him to press the button to open the door and let those things in. I think they're leaving, Mrs. Barnes whispered. I took a quick look out of the window and saw that they were almost back to their cars. A minute later, we heard the slamming of car doors and the sounds of their cars speeding out of the parking lot. Is it safe, Dad? Ali asked. 
They're all gone, I said. Now we need to make sure it is safe in here for us. Mrs. Barnes walked over to Rick. Why did they leave? she asked. They must have thought no one was here, he said. But I thought you said they were smart. What about the generator noise and the bus? she asked. Wouldn't those draw them in? I've been studying them since this first started. I know exactly what I'm doing, he said. Trish walked over to Rick and said, Care to enlighten us then? Rick smiled again. You just got here. Come make yourselves at home. There will be plenty of time for that later. But I am getting hungry. The kitchen is over there, he said, pointing to a doorway at the end of the garage. I hope you brought some good food. Why don't you be a good host and show us around first, I said, and then we will talk about food and whether we will be staying. His eyes grew narrow, and he let out a big sigh. <sighs> Fine. Follow me for a tour of your new home. Ali grabbed my hand and whispered to me, I don't like him. He's not very nice and seems like he has a secret he doesn't want to tell us. I think you're right, I said. We'll be extra careful and on guard while we're here. I waved Trish and Mrs. Barnes over, and they were just as concerned as us. We were all on high alert for something bad to happen, but we followed him through the door in the back and into the big kitchen. There were a couple of big refrigerators, two ovens, and a big sink in there. It looked to be a well-stocked kitchen, with pots and pans, plates and bowls, and other kitchen utensils. You can put all your food in here, he said. Do that first, before you get settled in here. He then took us back into the hallway and into the dining room. There were multiple tables and chairs set up. As we were about to walk out of the room, Ali pulled on my hand a couple of times. What is it? I whispered. Look over there, she said, pointing to the back of the room. There were double doors in the back of the room where she was pointing, and I noticed they were secured with a padlock. It's probably just a big closet with electronic equipment or other important things, I said. We should go catch up with the others, but good job noticing that. We quickly caught up with the others and walked past some offices and training rooms before going up the stairs. This is where you can sleep, said Rick, as we went past a dorm-like setup of the four rooms. All of the doors were opened and appeared to be unused, which was a good sign that he may be telling the truth about being alone. But I wondered where he slept. Before I could ask, Arvin spoke up. So, where do you sleep then? he asked. Rick glared at Arvin. Apparently, he didn't like to be questioned. I have my own room downstairs, he said. I didn't recall seeing any rooms that looked like they were being used, but I didn't think it was a good idea to push it with him now. We needed a place to stay and, despite the strangeness of Rick, this seemed to be our best short-term option. Okay, let's get some food, Rick said, rubbing his hands together. You did bring it in, didn't you? There may have been some things left on the bus, but it looked like most people grabbed their things when we got off the bus. I reached into my backpack, pulled out a granola bar, and offered it to Rick. He snatched it from my hand and said, I hope you brought more than that. There is plenty of room in the kitchen. Put all your food in there. I walked over to where Mrs. Barnes, Jessica, and Trish were standing. Trish had been helping Jessica to get around during the tour of the building. Do you think we should stay? I whispered. I think we need to for now, said Mrs. Barnes. Besides, we can take care of that old fool if he gets out of line, she smiled. I think we should organise our night watch too. Hey, what are you talking about over there? snapped Rick. We're just discussing room assignments said Trish. Fine, fine. I'll be in the kitchen. Hurry up and bring the rest of your food. With that, Rick went back down the stairs and out of sight. What a weird little man, said Trish. We definitely shouldn't put all our food down there. I'll go talk to the others and we'll put a few things down there so he stops bothering us. Good idea, I said, handing her a couple more granola bars. After you do that, let's figure out where we're all going to sleep and then figure out a night watch schedule. Once they were finished stocking the kitchen with some food, we worked out who would sleep where. Each room fit two people comfortably, so Mrs. Barnes and her daughter took one, and a few other people paired up and took the others. The rest of us went downstairs to see what other rooms may be good. Let's go in here, Ali said, as she and Clara ran into a big training room. There was a big screen at the front and a projector hanging from the ceiling, as well as a bunch of tables and chairs. 
the girls began running around and exploring the room. Mind if we join you in here? asked Jessica, who was leaning on Trish for support. Not at all, I said. I'll feel safer with the two of you in here. Plus, I can help with Jessica if we need to leave in a hurry. She was still limping pretty badly. We can get you set up in here and change your bandages. Hey, Dad! What are these? Ali shouted from the other side of the room. They'd opened up a closet door. Looks like cots for sleeping, I said. What's a cot? Ali asked. Is that short for something? No, that's just what they're called. At least that's all I've ever heard them called, I said. Then, I walked over to the supply closet they were looking in and pulled out one of the folded up cots. After a little finagling with it, I got it to open. It's a portable bed. Cool, said Clara. It looks like there are a lot of them. I'm sure they keep them around for emergencies. Do you girls want to wheel enough out for all of us, and then we can offer up the rest of the others? Okay, said Ollie. I wheeled the one I had opened over to the back of the room. Jessica, why don't you lie down and we can look for some bandages for you? Trish helped her get on the cot, and then said she would go look around for the bandages. I helped Ali and Clara set up the rest of the cots, and then they pushed them together by the tables and started making a fort. It would be better with blankets, said Clara. You're never too old to build a fort. That was one of my favourite activities with Ali. We would use the couch cushions, chairs, and whatever we could find to build a giant fort in the living room. Then we'd have snacks or lunch in it while playing on our tablets or with her toys. I went back to the closet and found a full shelf full of blankets and sheets. Here's some, but only use a few so we can make sure we have enough for everyone. Ali and Clara ran over and each took a couple to bring back to their fort. This is going to be the biggest fort ever, Ali said. It was great to see both girls happy and distracted for at least a little while. This was a good opportunity for me to discuss our plans with some of the others. I'll be back soon, I said to Ali and Clara. You girls have fun. We will, Ali shouted from under the table. I walked over to Jessica. Trish should be back soon with the bandages. I'm going to talk with the others about watch duty and an escape plan. I'll fill you in when I get back. Sounds good, Jessica said. Let me know if I can help. Hearing the girls giggling as I walked out of the room added to my hope that things could someday get better. I walked past some of the others and a couple of the officers, and Arvin and his family were in the other training room. I told them all to grab a cot from my room, and that I was going to get a group together to discuss our safety plans. We agreed to meet in the dining room in about ten minutes. After I went upstairs to let the others know, I walked around the building again to see if there was anything I missed on the tour. I peeked in a couple of the doors we had passed by before, which were just closets with additional supplies, mostly office-related items. Nothing seemed unusual, until I got back in the garage. First, I noticed another door that looked to go into another room or hallway that we hadn't seen. But before I went through the door, I checked the storage areas and lockers in the garage. I expected to find the firefighters' protective gear and tools, but there weren't any. The cubby areas and the cabinets I saw were all empty. No boots, helmets, air tanks, axes, or other things you would expect to see. I hoped maybe people had come in here and taken things to defend themselves when this first started happening. But it still made me uneasy, especially with how Rick behaved. Although I needed to get to the dining room and speak to the others, I wanted to at least see where that door led. The light from the garage illuminated another hallway when I opened the door. I flipped the switches on the wall, but no lights came on. There were a couple of doors on one side of the hallway, and then another one at the end, that I could just barely see. I wasn't going any further alone, but this would be good to report to the others. Rick wasn't around anywhere during my walk around the building. I thought I would see him in the kitchen, stuffing his face, when I made it back to the dining room. Most of the others were already there. Arvin, Katie, and Mrs. Barnes sat on one side of a table, and Adam, Jared, and Laura sat across from them. Trish wasn't there yet, but she was likely helping Jessica still. Mrs. Barnes looked over at me and said, Katie and I brought Kira and Carolyn to play in your room with all the other kids. They will be safe with Jessica, Brian, and Arvin's wife watching them. They were having a great time when we left. Great. I'm glad they get to play together and have fun for a change, I said, before joining them at the table. What's with that old man? asked Jared. 
I don't trust him. I don't think any of us do, said Katie. He's a weird little man. I may have found out where he hides out or sleeps, or does whatever he does, I said. There's another door from the garage that he didn't take us through. I took a quick look in there, and it went to another hallway, but none of the lights turned on when I flipped the switches. We should see what he has going on down there, said Jared. I'll be glad to go with anyone else that wants to join me. After the kids go to sleep, I can go, I said. Maybe we should all just stay in the training room so no one is alone, and so we can make a quick getaway if we need to. We found plenty of cots in the closet there. Good idea, said Mrs. Barnes. I'll go with you guys. The three of us can also be the first ones on watch. We should stay at least in groups of two to be safer. Katie and Adam, do you want to take the next shift with me? Laura asked. They both nodded in agreement. Arvin said, I can ask Trish and Brian to go with me for the third shift. Great, we have a plan, said Jared. We'll all get our things and meet together in the training room. We can bring some snacks for the kids too, said Katie. It was getting close to Ali's bedtime, but I guess her bedtime didn't really matter much anymore. I'm sure she was having so much fun with the other kids, and I really wanted her to enjoy these opportunities when they came up. I went back into the training room, and nearly all of the tables were pushed together or turned over and organised into this massive fort with multiple table tunnels. They must have used most of the blankets and sheets to cover the fort. Arvin's wife was sitting next to Jessica, chatting, while Brian was running around playing with the kids, and I think Trish was inside the tent with them. Everyone looked to be having a good time. I sat down for a little rest, before our hallway exploration was to begin. Closing my eyes for a minute, I listened to the laughter, and imagined I was outside in the summer, with Ali, while she played with her friends in the sprinkler. I let the memory hang on for a couple minutes, before opening my eyes and rejoining my reality. The others were starting to come in with their things and setting up their cots for the night. Katie had a couple of bags of chips and some plates that she took with her into the fort. Then I heard Jessica. Hey Joe, where's Trish? I thought she was here with you, I said. Jessica started trying to get off the bed. She left after she fixed up my bandages. That was like 15 minutes ago. Don't get up. We'll go find her. I think I know where to look, I said. I called for Mrs. Barnes and Jared, who quickly came over. We need to go now. Trish is missing. Katie and Brian ran to check the other nearby rooms and upstairs while we made sure we had our flashlights and guns ready. As soon as they got back, we headed out the door. We ran down the hallway and pushed through the door into the garage. The garage door was open, letting the chilly night air into the large dark room. What the hell? said Jared. Where's the button to close the door? Mrs. Barnes ran over to where Rick had been standing when we got here. It's over here somewhere, she said. She quickly found the button and pressed it. I was sure nothing would happen, but I was glad to be proven wrong when the door began to close. After the door closed all the way, I felt a very slight relief that we were a little safer. But then I noticed the door to the unexplored hallway was propped open and lights were shining brightly just beyond the door. The lights didn't work when I tried them, I said. I walked through the hallway and flipped the switches off. But the lights stayed on. Well, I guess we should go in and see if we can find Trish.